Hello and welcome to the Smart Divorce Podcast. I am very happy to be joined today by David Lester. Hi David, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Excellent, I'm good, thank you. Um, David is a partner and head of family law at Ward Hadaway. He won the Family Law Solicitor of the Year Award at Jordan's National Family Law Awards, was nominated Partner of the Year at the 2022 Modern Law Awards and the Yorkshire Legal Awards. He's believed to be the first solicitor in the UK to have represented both husband and wife in divorce. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, which is very, very exciting. So give us a bit of background, David, about, about why, why working in divorce is so important to you. Um, so I, I had a very unusual or very difficult experience of early family life in many senses. My parents separated when I was 18 months old and my mum went through a series of abusive relationships that culminated in her struggling with alcoholism. And my father went in a different direction and became addicted to heroin. And I, as a consequence, saw a lot of difficulty and a lot of pain when I was growing up. And what that meant was when I finished my law degree and I got the opportunity to choose the kind of law that, that I wanted to do, um, family felt like a natural fit because I'd seen it all before. I'd seen, you know, bruises, not just physical ones, but, you know, all the things that come with family breakdown and all the, the aftermath of that and how it can affect people longer term but also how they can come back from that and that life can be better. And I make no criticism of my mother, for example, you know, she's, she turned herself around really quickly and she's become this matriarch of our family and a wonderful mother and grandmother. And so I've seen it come full circle and it enables me to say to people who are at the beginning of that process, you're going to be all right. And I can say that with conviction, um, knowing that it, that it's true. And I think that was, that all, all that early experience really drove me towards somewhere or, or a field that I can show that I care and that I understand. And I don't think I could do that if I was selling property, for example. <laughs> that makes sense. And I, I know that um, we use this phrase, good divorce or, or amicable divorce. And then I know that, that you're um, keen on helping people to come out of out of the divorce in it in a good place um tell me a little bit more about why that's so important to you again in my early career I, you know I, my nickname was litigious lister um and I was the one that was, <laughs> I know I know or the Yorkshire Terrier um you know <laughs> I was always in court banging my fists on tables and and you know shouting the odds and as I've grown older and, and matured, I've realised that that's not the way to deal with it. And yeah, you get a name for yourself for being a bit of a bulldog, but does it actually help? You know, solicitors, we have a code that we have to subscribe to. And, and part of that is acting in their best interests. And for a long time, I thought best interests meant getting them the most money or getting them the most time with their children. But then if they become a terrible person as a result of that experience or a broken person as a result of what you've done or contributed to, are you acting in their best interests or are you acting in the interests of your firm and your target? And that, what, that's what made me change my outlook in, in more recent years. So um, it was in around about 2019 that I went to my current boss and said, no fault divorces coming into play. We're going to end up with a system where people don't have to blame one another anymore. Um, how about we create a model that enables people to use the same solicitor? And at that time, barristers were tinkering with it. And obviously mediators were able to mediate, but without giving legal advice. And my concern, not just for clients, but for solicitors as well, was that we would end up being marooned on this island where we couldn't do either. And so it took about 18 years to, sorry, 18 months to develop. And in September of last year, we launched um, a, a process um, at my old firm, which um, saw me able to act for both couples. And it was all uh, sort of 
in, in, in compliance with the rules and the regulations. And I was really keen to make sure that it was a, a properly thought out product and process. And at that time, another firm did launch a similar product, um, but I don't know if I got there first. So the first case we dealt with, we dealt with it in seven weeks and we lodged the court order um, on behalf of both parties. But I don't know if the other firm did it in six weeks. So where I say I think I'm the first divorce lawyer to do it, it could very well have been another lawyer. But in any event, I was definitely one of the first two. But it's it's changed how I perceive my job. And I absolutely love working with two parties because imagine this, imagine doing your job for, for 10 years and never hearing a husband and a wife actually say a word to each other. I've been having those conversations between two people that loved each other and created children. And then to all of a sudden be on a call with somebody that leans to his left or her left and says, well, what do you think about this to their other partner? And it just blew my mind. I thought, God, how easy is that? Rather than me writing a letter and them approving it, and then going to their lawyer and their lawyer repeating what I've said and inevitably misinterpreting how I've worded it because it suits them too. You get to say to them both, well, what do you think? And it just completely shifts the dynamic to the point where when you put the phone down at the end of a call, you're smiling rather than grimacing. And the feedback that we've had from it has been phenomenal. You know, people have said, I can't believe that this hasn't been available sooner. I can't believe that people bother with two lawyers. Why would they pay for two when they can pay for one? And it's just changed. And if I could do it all of the time, I would. And I get that there's a place for uh, place for court, you know, where there's been domestic abuse, it's not appropriate, where the assets are incredibly complex. Um, although it's arguable that it's still suitable for those cases, but sometimes you do need judicial intervention and that's important. But there are very few cases for who this would not be a viable option. And I think since, since I launched it, I think there are now eight or nine other firms that are doing it, which tells me it will continue to grow. And I think it, it, it guarantees you a good divorce. There's no way you can get it wrong if it's properly managed and you both come to the table with your cards facing up with a sensible head, acknowledging that it's a transaction, you'll be fine. And, and you don't have to go through any more a painful experience than it already is. Yeah, no, it... It does make complete sense. Um, I can, I suppose I've done some work with couples myself and um, because obviously I can act as a financial neutral for couples. Um, and it strikes me that it's more tricky where there's a power imbalance. So where you've got one partner who is the more financially able and educated, has always looked after the finances and also wants to overpower the other person. How do you manage those sorts of situations? Is that something you've come across? Yeah, it is. It is. And we have to be really careful. Um, and again, I'm, I'm doing some training of other lawyers now around it. Um, so they all have an initial and separate call with me, first of all, for me to just see where their head's at, but also see what their capabilities are. Not just, I don't mean how clever they are. I mean, <laughs> can they, can they, put across their thought process are, are they nervous or timid have they got a financial background or a background where they're used to being on zoom calls for example because some people for, for you and I this is normal now isn't it but some yeah. people prefer to be in a room and have never known anything different so there's a case we had recently where the gentleman in the divorce was actually a financial advisor so he was very clued up very savvy own business so he was used to looking around the PL and, and he got it um, she had been part-time um, working whilst raising children, hadn't really been in the world of computers or anything like that for, for quite some time. And so what we did in that case was we made sure that we explained things to her in a way that made sense and gave her extra time to ask questions, to get her head around certain figures that we were talking about. And I would... I would you know, husband sat very patiently whilst I did this. Um, you know, we're talking through every single number and say, look, we're starting here. 
and we're going to do these things and we end up here and that's how we get to what to, to the number that we're talking about. Does that make sense? And we give her the option to go away and speak to somebody like yourself, for example, because they're able to have these external people involved. When you're in the court, if you want an expert to comment, you have to have the court's permission usually, and that adds another layer of costs and usually another layer of delay. But in these processes that are outside of the court, and there are many of them, we can bring somebody like you in to the joint call and say, we've got this question and we just want you to explain, because you're actually the expert, how we've arrived at this number or how we might arrive at this number in a way that's tax efficient or whatever. And it, and it just becomes a much more tea, a much better team effort. Um, and that, for me, you can't put a price on that. It's great. No, absolutely. And I do think that, let's be brutally honest, people are very cost conscious when they're, when they're getting divorced in most cases. And there are some who just want their day in court aren't yeah. cost conscious because that it's not about cost it's about making sure they've had their day in court and I guess we're never going to get over that in some way shape or form have you have you met with anybody that you've kind of I know you said before you sort of feel that this is this should be available to everybody and all couples should be able to go down this route have you met with any couples where you've said where you've thought ah, this is not for them this is not going to yeah. work for them yeah, so I had, had a cheeky chappy call me recently and say, um, I'm Mr. X, I've been in the army for several years, I've built up all these savings, because you don't spend your money when you're in the army, it's one of the perks of the job, I suppose, um, and I've got this fantastic pension, and uh, we've got X number of children, and my wife's pregnant with our fifth, um, and we've agreed that she won't have anything, and that she's just going to move out with the kids. And I said to him, um, that's not going to work. Um, I said, this, because your starting point is so vastly outside what a court would ever consider to be suitable, it's going to take me a long time to get you into the realms of reasonableness. It's going to take your wife a lot of effort to cope with the process with five children and one on the way and no financial means with which to put her point across. And I just don't think that this is the right thing for you. I said, I'll represent you. I won't tell you what you want to hear because what you want is wrong. But um, <laughs> it wouldn't be something that I would take on for both of you. Um, and his reaction was a little bit, you know, puffy, puffy. And, you know, he, he didn't end up instructing me in the end. But that's life, isn't it? If, if, if some people want a yes man or woman, they'll go and find them. And there are plenty of lawyers out there who will take your money and tell you that you're right. But I'm not one of them. So where they come to me, I always try and give them an honest appraisal and I say, look, you know, I either can help you or I'm not the right person for you. And, and that tends to be it. Rather than the process itself not being suitable, it's more the people who aren't suitable for it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, I completely see that. I think um, we, we quite often see this, you know, we talked before about this good divorce and this amicable divorce, and there are there are people kind of out there who are feeling like, well, I, I didn't manage to have that. Do you find that you need both parties on board in order to make that work? Yeah, they've got to be. And there's got, um, it, we had a lovely meeting with a couple recently where the husband wasn't ready to have the divorce. He would have happily finished it. And um, unusually, they were sitting in the same room and I, I don't ordinarily support that. And I, I, I had made clear to them prior that they needed to be in separate spaces, but they'd missed that. Um, and I said, OK, well, as today is just me giving you some information, I'm happy for you to sit in the same room, but I do want you to be separate later. Because, of course, you don't know if somebody's gripping somebody's fist on the ta under the table or, you know, there's a gun at their head. Not, not literally, would hope. But, yeah. um, so it's important for them to have that space. But this particular meeting, again, it was one of those moments where I've never seen it before, but he started to cry and she hugged him and told him it was going to be all right. Oh. And I've never seen that. And the court system doesn't give you the opportunity to observe that either. And actually her being in the room with him supported him through that in a way that I wasn't able to because I wasn't there for him. I would have given him a hug if, you know, because 
I'm that kind of person. But you know, um, it, it for them, it it was um, it was just doing it a bit differently. But it but it did it did work. Um, so I think people need their own process and their own they, they need the flexibility of choice, don't they? You know, where you've yeah. talked about courts and you've talked about is it the right option for them and whatever. Um, the more items there are on the menu, I think the more people will choose what they want to take a bite out of rather than, you know, it being a set course menu. And sometimes you think, well, I don't want sweet and sour chicken. I want chicken and black bean tonight. <laughs> because we're human, aren't we? And we want choice. And I think that giving, particularly separating couples who are going through this awful experience, taking back the, the part of taking back control is choosing isn't it it's yeah. you have the choice and by giving them those options you, you put them on the pathway to feeling like they've got hold of the reins again and for me once somebody does feel like they've got a bit more control and they can steer a bit they ease up and the tension eases up and they become a bit more amenable and then their ex becomes a bit more amenable and all of a sudden everybody's a bit like Oh yeah, I can see where you're coming from now. Whereas before, when they're in that flat spin and they don't know what direction they're heading in and they've no control over it. It's a bit like when you get off the waltzer, isn't it? You have to just stand still for a bit before you can actually focus on the direction you want to walk in. And I think that divorce does that to people. And I just kind of want to give them that that route through the fog. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I, that menu idea is really interesting because there are there are more and more options available to not have to go to court, to not assume that that this process is all about going to court and having a having a battle, which I never liked the idea that divorce becomes a battle, because as you said before, doesn't that's not going to end well. And it's going to take longer to come back around to, to have that better life afterwards. You mentioned costs earlier and just now about court. I think the average. I think the average court time, if you litigate your divorce, is between 18 and 24 months. And I think there were some statistics released in 2017 or 18. And if you looked at those in accordance with the, the, the growth rates over time, I, I think I worked it out that the average spend per person on a divorce, a litigated divorce, is about £18,000, which is just a phenomenal amount of money. From somebody that grew up on a council estate, you know, with a mom on benefits, that's a huge amount of money. Um, that couple that I talked to you about earlier, where the husband was a financial advisor, their costs overall, they, their costs that they shared were £4,000 plus that, and plus, plus their court fees. They had a business valuation done that cost them £1,800 plus that. So they, they weren't even in the realms of spending a quarter I think of the overall fees that you would spend if you went through court and that was sorted out in less than six months so a third of the average time and it only took six months because we had the valuation done that took a couple of months so if you shave that out of the process you're talking weeks um to get yourself to to towards you know a bit of certainty and that again people when people talk about acting in people's best interests if you can get, if you can shorten some, somebody's, if they were poorly, for example, and you're a doctor, you would be wanting to give them medication to make that illness go away. You wouldn't be giving them something to prolong the illness, would you? Yeah. And we do, if you think about it like that, if we're, if we're sending them to court, we're, we're, we know that we're prolonging that pain. Actually, if we can shorten it, that surely is acting in their best interest. So I think it's about lawyers shifting their mindset and, and not associating getting them the most money with their best interests. I want my clients to be able to sit next to each other at their child's wedding or graduation or whatever, or God forbid, if their children are in a hospital. I want them to both be able to sit at the side of their hospital bed and, and not grimace when they see the sight of one another. And I think that you know, should be most lawyers' aims in most cases where it's, where it's appropriate absolutely we talk all the time on this podcast about um keeping the children if you've got children of the marriage front and center and being able to go and watch their dance show together being able to go and watch their rugby match together being able to go to parents evenings together because mm -hmm. what happens if you can't 
is only one of you gets to go. And then how does the other one have a clue about what's going on? If you're sharing care for the for the children, that just makes life really, really difficult. So I yeah, remember I, I remember when I graduated from law school um, and it was the first time that my parents had ever attended anything jointly in my entire education. This was when I was 18 months old. They never came to anything together for my whole education. Um, and they, through gritted teeth, agreed to come to my graduation together. And my grandparents came as well um, on my dad's side. And I remember having to run from one corner of the hall to the other to see my granny and grandpa and my dad, to then go and stand with my mum for five minutes who was by herself to make sure she was okay, to run back and make sure my granny and grandpa had got a drink, to run back to my mum's church. It was the most miserable day. And I remember I was flying on holiday with my, my friends that evening. Um, so I actually went, I jumped in a taxi from my graduation in my suit that I'd worn and went straight to the airport. And it was only at that moment that I actually got a chance to stop and celebrate the fact that I got a law degree because that, that whole process was miserable. And when I graduated from the LPC, I said to my mum and dad, you can come, but I'm not having any of that nonsense this time. We're gonna go out for a meal and you're gonna to talk to each other and you're gonna be friends and you're gonna smile for the pictures together and you're gonna get a second chance to do it. And they did, and it wasn't much more pleasant day but in life you don't always get that second chance to do it do you so you know again from my own personal experiences of that I can say to clients you do not want your children to feel how I felt on that day and that that changes my approach for the better absolutely I had a similar experience at my wedding with my parents my both my parents were there they're horrendous in the same room together you know they divorced I was 12 so quite a bit older than you <laughs> when yours did but yeah they they just still you know however many years on a lot of years on and there's you know they're still in that same place they can't spend time together and you don't want that for your kids you don't want your kids ever to have to go through that I'm worried about this really exciting celebration that we're about to have because I don't want my parents in the same room together it's it's an awful thing to have to go through yeah. so totally yeah. with you Talk me through, I know you said that your process begins with a phone call with each person separately, but could you talk me through the re how the rest of the process would work? Yeah, yeah, of course. So they have the quite, quite often it'll be one person that gets in touch initially and says, I've read about this, um, I think it's suitable for us. And then I'll speak to them. But really importantly, I won't give them any advice because it's important if they do go through the process that everybody gets the advice together. So I'll speak to the first person just to gather a little bit of information and say, what does the picture look like? But don't give me anything that's too kind of in your favour. I just want a very gentle picture. 15 minutes usually, it lasts 20 minutes maybe. And I reassure them that when, if I decide that it's suitable for them, I'll tell them about the process in more detail later. And then arrange a call with the other party. And I, again, I reassure them, I say, look, your partner's told me nothing that's too saucy she's literally or he's literally told me that you live in a house that you've got two children that you're both employed and that you both think a divorce might be suitable for you and that that's pretty much it what do you think so I'll suss them both out and then I'll send them both an email that says I've had a chat with you both and I've explained to you my function is to be neutral and not to be on anybody's side so in the circumstances that you tell me to proceed I will be both of your solicitor and um, here is a participation agreement, similarly to what is used in the collaborative process, which is, but it's not as restrictive as the collaborative process. You don't have to sack your lawyer at the end of it if things don't work out. So it, it's got the rules in it, which basically say we are going to behave, we are going to be respectful, we are going to be honest and upfront and all these things. Quite a lengthy document, actually, but they sign up to that. And then we have a first meeting. And in that meeting, I will get the, the full picture from them both. And quite often, in most cases, you, you may laugh when you think about this, because I know it's true to, to my marriage. Um, there's always one person that's really good with paperwork and numbers and always one person that goes, I don't know what day, what day's Wednesday. Um, so I won't tell you which one I am in my relationship. But, um, <laughs> but so usually one person sets the scene and then I'll just set check with the other person. Is that right? Is that your understanding? 
um, and we'll start creating that picture. And then what I'll do is I'll talk to them about the law. Quite often people aren't interested in the law, actually. They just want to know what they're going to get at the end of it, but we have to play the law to them. So I'll talk to them about uh, the concept of needs, for example, being largely dictatorial in the, in the separation process. So I'll explain that the umbrella of needs is quite far reaching and usually there are three pockets of need that sit underneath it and those needs comprise of housing needs, income needs, retirement needs. So how much do you need to put a roof above your head? How much do you need to put food in the fridge and fuel in the car? And what do you need to look after when you see, look after yourself when you've stopped working? I'll explain that process to them and I'll explain that's how we will be looking to separate the assets using that as a, as a sort of anchor. And then I'll explain to them that they've both got some homework to do. I'll say, right, you're going to get a form from one of my juniors in my team. They will help you both complete it together and they will then prepare a plan on the page of your, your, your assets, a schedule of assets. And then we'll meet for a second time to work through that schedule. So you might have both given different figures for a property value, for example. So we'll discuss that in our second call. Or one of you might have given some information that's caused the other to think, that doesn't quite make sense to me. Can you explain it? And it might be dealt with in that meeting, that second meeting, or it might be that we adjourn off as you would for court to get some answers or some evaluation, for example. And then once everybody's satisfied that that schedule of assets is how it should look, and that may include some expert involvement, it may not, then we'll come together for a third time. And then I'll explain to them what I consider to be the parameters for settlement, what a judge would do. And when I talk about judges, I don't mean that they're going to end up in front of one, but it's always helpful for them to have in their mind, if we don't agree, what would a judge do? What's my best day in court? What's my worst day in court? And usually they're not that far outside of the brackets. And then, so they've had that. So they've had meeting one, telling them the process, meeting two, gathering the information and assessing it, meeting three, reviewing the parameters for settlement. And then usually a fourth step is them coming back to the table saying, thought about what you said, I'd quite like the outcome to look like this. And the other party might say, well, I'd quite like it to look like that. And so that fourth session is about bridging that gap between them. And we've had a hundred percent success rate so far. Nobody has got to the process of not reached an agreement. Um, and then we draft the court order and we send it off to court to be approved with our name on behalf of both parties. And the orders are being approved, which tells us the judges are happy for us to do it. So all in all, it's a really neat process. And the beauty of it is they can set the pace. So if they say, well, we want to meet at 12 o'clock on Wednesday and we want you know, pink wafer biscuits, and you know, they get to choose. You don't get that if you're going to court. The court says, well, I've only got a slot in November at two o'clock, like it or leave it. And I had a really unfortunate case last year. To give you an example of just how restrictive that can be, um, a gentleman had, had, had briefed a barrister whose fee was £25,000. Um, the court moved the hearing to a date when that barrister wasn't available, but the client still had to pay because that was that they'd already done all the work. So he, got, he had to pay £25,000 for a hearing for a barrister who then wasn't available um, and had to pay another £25,000 for a different barrister. And that barrister did nothing wrong. They'd done all the work. They were entitled to charge their fee. It was in accordance with their terms. The client understood that. But it was deeply unfortunate that it happened. And it only happened because of the court system being so under-resourced. So it was, it, you know, stuff like that that, don't happen in this process because you choose the pace who's involved and if you have to move something nobody loses out because you say okay well we'll do it next week instead yeah yeah it sounds sounds like a sensible thing to do to me as long as both parties are able to communicate with one another and, and kind of they're not as you say they're not kind of a million miles apart it just seems looking out outside looking in that 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 would make far more sense you you only need to watch and i know it's fiction but you only need to watch marriage story oh i know no <laughs> well I've, we've all met lawyers like those two in that you know the ones who are just very 
half-hearted and just kind of let things drift and act as a letterbox or the other one who whatever you say that it, you know they'll interpret it with a poison pen and, and I, I've seen it this week and I, and I laughed to myself because um, I'll send the letter and I know exactly what I mean but I'll say to the client I can't word it any differently but I can tell you the response I'm going to get is that x y and z and then me and the clients have a laugh about it because they say <laughs> we knew that's how they were going to react and again, creating that environment where you can laugh about it rather than the client getting these nasty letters and going, oh, I can't believe they've said that about me. That's not true. And I'll say, well, I told you they were going to say that. We know it's not true. We know that they're doing that just to drive up their client's costs. They want to get to the courtroom door. They're then going to settle. It's not my way of doing it. I don't agree with it. But some people do do that. And, and when you're in a profession that is target driven and driven by chargeable time it's difficult to get away from that sometimes isn't it which is why I prefer to operate on a fixed fee basis because it gives the client certainty and the client can have faith that no matter how much time I spend on it, it's not going to cost them any more um, and I, I've likened it to sort of other professions where they do fixed fees and, and I've come under fire from other lawyers in, in likening ourselves to builders and whatnot but at the end of the day if you can't scope out what a job is going to involve you know when you've usually got two degrees and 10 years experience then there's something wrong isn't there so so I'd always be wary of the kind of lawyers that say well I can't really tell you how it's not much it's going to cost it very it depends well it, it it, it, it depends yeah but it largely depends on your approach as much as anything so I think yeah. we've got to center check ourselves a little bit consumers are not stupid you know they, yeah. they know how it works now they can find out the information they want if we don't get to the point where we're giving them certainty on costs soon they'll not use us they'll use They'll use other businesses that are deregulated, that are sorry, that aren't regulated, that but that can give them a fixed price because that's what they want. Yeah, no, absolutely great. Um, that's really interesting that you work on a fixed fee because I've I've worked with so many clients who will ring me because I work on a fixed fee rather than ringing their lawyer, who's who they really need to talk to. Yeah. Because they don't want to be charged 120 quid for an email, because they don't want to be charged for the phone call. They don't want me to talk to their lawyer because they they know I won't charge them any extra, but it's costing them money for me to speak to their lawyer from their lawyer. And it's yeah. it, it's tying your hands behind your back whilst you're trying to do the best for the client. And it's it's very difficult. It makes complete sense to me. Yeah. You work on a fixed fee. I think some people think when you mention fixed fee, it means cheap. It doesn't. <laughs> I've just agreed a fixed price of £36,000 with somebody. And I've costed their file out, spent, spent an hour costing out every single step. And I've built in a contingency and I've assessed the type of client that I've got. So they are a needy client. And I've, I've talked to them about that. I've said to them openly, you are needy. And so whereas a normal client might say to me, oh, I don't need to speak to you this month. I know that you're going to want to speak to me every week. And so whereas a normal case, it might cost X, because of your personality type and what you tell me you want, I am putting a premium on this because you are going to have more of my time. I think some lawyers really struggle with conversations like that with clients. It's like a taboo subject costs. And what then happens is they bill them at the end of the month and then the client complains. Whereas if you have that conversation at the beginning and you say, look, what do you want from me? What are you going to need from me? And I will then work like that. And it's only like, you know, when you go to the supermarket, you know, you, you can buy Tesco value sausages and it doesn't come in a nice packet and it's, you know, they're usually a bit squashed, but you pay 15 <laughs> pence. Or you can go and you can buy Tesco finest and you pay a bit more, but the packaging's a bit nicer and the sausages are a bit thicker and they're a bit tasty. Or you can go to the butchers and you can say, I want that sausage and I want that sausage and I want you, and I'm paying the premium for it. It's exactly the same. You, you can have that conversation with clients do you want it cheap and dirty do you want it a little bit different or do you want me to be at your beck and call 24 hours a day because I will be but you've got to pay for it yeah. and and it's it's again it's that kind of thing we're used to being able to you know when you go on um, I, I always liken it to um different uh 
different customer experience. But you know, when you go on a, on a car comparison website um, or a, a car insurance, and you get that table that says what's included for the price, yeah. it's red ticks, ticks and red crosses. That's how consumers are used to purchasing services these days. And the law is no different to that. So I think it's that that kind of makes me think we've got to catch up. And, and this process that we've created with the fixed pricing and the one lawyer model, I think goes great lengths to, to set the scene. And I'm really pleased that other lawyers are following suit because it, it only benefits the client. Yeah, absolutely. How, um, because I'm guessing that lots of people don't know about this service at the moment and don't realise that the only, there is an option to have one lawyer for the, for the both of them. How, how can, other than I realise talking to me is going to help, but how can we spread the word that, that this is available, that, that this is an option to clients? I think, you know, people like you, people who come into contact with couples where they are thinking about separation, it's about catching them at that early stage and not letting them fall into the trap of the traditional model. Once you've got your own lawyer in place, that's it then. You end up pitted against each other in many cases. Some lawyers are really, really good at being collaborative, picking up the phone to the other lawyer. But again, there's a lot of catching up to do in terms of that. Um, so it's about getting them, at, uh, you know, mortgage providers, you know, people will contact their mortgage provider and say, we're thinking about remortgaging because we're splitting up and my ex wants to buy me out. They can capture the people at the beginning and say, well, if you're thinking about it, let's work together with this person. They can help. We can all get on a call together and we can all discuss it. I think that for me is the key. And then it's just about getting the message out there, like you say, talking to people on podcasts giving examples i think people really like to see worked case studies so we've just released one um recently talking about a specific case that showed people how long it lasted who was involved what the costs were what the issues were so people can look at it and go that's quite like my situation actually we we've, we've got similar problems and it will it will gain traction it's already gaining traction um, much more quickly than i'd, I'd anticipated and, and also firms with credibility offering it. So there are other firms that are offering it that are very, very good firms. And you know that those firms of real quality, if they are pushing it, it means it's worth pushing. They wouldn't put their neck on the line to champion a process like this if, if it wasn't good and viable. So I think that's the other thing. People that have got some clout getting behind it and not being afraid. Some people will say, well, it's the turkeys voting for Christmas. But it's, it's not. It's just, if you think, I think there are something like 50% of people who get divorced don't go near a lawyer. And I usually, I, I think the, percent, the, the, the reasons for that will be cost. And I don't want, I don't want to have a fight. So you, you're pitching to that other half of the market and also a, a large proportion of, the mar proportion of the market that if they could use one lawyer, they would. And my old firm, we did a survey and I think something like 78% of people said if we could have had one lawyer and not two, we would have. And I think that was a survey of about 2,000 people. So not a small sample. Yeah. I think it's I think it's a great idea. I think that um, having spoken to you today, now understanding more about what you do, uh, it, it feels like a, a bit of a no-brainer. And, um, you know, for those clients that it's appropriate for. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked that I should have asked that you're dying to tell me about? No, no, no. <laughs> not at all. I think the only thing that I was, was sort of um, keen to, to explain really is where, this is not me selling your services, but where <laughs> you guys could come in. Um, one of the things that I do with people at the beginning, I don't, I don't necessarily always, with people outside of separating together, the process I've just talked about, um, one of the things that I do is I, I try and work out a plan with them rather than talking to them about the law I'll say let's go and right move and look at a house that you think you'd like to move into in 12 months um, and I know that you do forecasts to, to look forward and say to people okay well if you end up with this you'll be able to get to that point and for me I think you can't underestimate the importance of that because giving somebody those stepping stones and saying to them, close your eyes, imagine where you want to be. And I go even further, I say, what colour is your sofa? You know, because I, I want them to put themselves in that new life and that new world. But it's a bit, if you don't have a target to aim towards, 
there's no point in firing your arrow, is there? Because you're just firing it into the empty space. So if you can give them those stepping stones to say, well, if you get this much, you can get that yellow sofa, and you can get that red car, and you that is rather than talking about what section 25 of the matrimonial causes act says, which we all know, but it's very dull. <laughs> giving people that opportunity to think about what does life look like for me yeah. with help from somebody like you which actually puts some science behind it because we can do the theory but you actually could do the numbers that that to me is a, is a really useful add-on um, and if they're saving money you know using one lawyer or they're saving money being sensible and not going through court then they've got the spare cash to be able to pay for somebody like you at the beginning rather than waiting to the end and then you say oh actually you should have had that pension instead of that one you know it, it, it's yeah. that kind of thing that that really helps so um i wouldn't um underestimate your own value add <laughs> it's a parting shot oh thank you no that's massively appreciated i think i think understanding what what that what the way you've se- you've agreed to separate your assets what that actually means in the context of your life and your lifestyle it isn't it's it's clarity and peace of mind and I think I think you're absolutely right I don't think that that can be underestimated at all thank you so much for joining me today well. I've really really enjoyed our conversation um if our uh, listeners and viewers want to get hold of you we'll put all your contact details in the show notes um, and I'm sure you'd be happy for people to contact you if they're interested in your yeah, services. Yeah, my mobile's always on. I always say to people, I'm not a nine to five lawyer. Um, much to my wife's upset, I take calls at one <laughs> morning. So in fact, I took a call from a client when she was having our first baby and in labour. So um, you can get me usually anytime. Yeah. And if you can't, I'll ring you back. <laughs> That's amazing. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.